Hi, my name is Lisa Sachs. I'm the director of the Bali Columbia Center on Sustainable International Investment here, and I'm, we're really, really thrilled to have all of you here. Thank you so much for coming, and we're delighted to be hosting at Columbia. Uh, but most of all, we're incredibly excited to launch this project, which has uh, been at least a year in the making, a lot of hard work, and, and not this launch is not a culmination, but actually um, a, a milestone, um, but we expect to continue to work on this hopefully with all of your input and, and continued support. Um, so I just wanted to take one minute to welcome you all here, but without further ado, I'm going to actually hand over the whole floor uh, and stage to Daniel Kaufman, the president of the um, Revenue Watch Institute Natural Resource Charter, who will introduce our panelists and, and the agenda for today. So thanks again very much. Thanks, Lisa. You were too, too quick. <laughs> Maybe not, most people know Lisa Sainz, but <clears throat> let me say that she, she heads it, the director of, of the VCC. Um, so thank you for hosting this. Thank you also for, for the great collaboration between VCC and Revenue Watch Natural Resource Charter. Both of our organizations are going to, to rebranding. Um, so that's another exciting part of our our collaboration. And it's, it's worth stating that there are a number of people here who <coughs> have been involved from the very beginning in this project, including in the, in the audience. I'm sure this will come up in, in the interactive part, because we want to make it very exciting and interactive. So we will start with the, the two presenters who will present together in one very crisp presentation, and that's Perrin Tordano and Wow. Um, Perrin is a senior economic researcher at the VCC of Valley Columbia Center. The full name is Valley Columbia Center on Sustainable International Investment at Columbia University. And she leads a research training and advisory project on fiscal regime, financial modeling, and leveraging extractive industry investment for development. Now, Andrew Bauer is uh, with us, an economic analyst. RWI, or Emerging Institute of Natural Resources Charter, is in charge of the two organizations, and <clears throat> is involved in many things, including advice to, to governments, parliamentarians, and civil society groups on oil, gas, and mineral revenue management. And he also works with companies and governments to improve extractive sector transparency uh, work. And, and then we have a very exciting plan that we have come, in fact, very far, is some of them, some of them from, from here. And I'll go, so we went already to Peru, we went to Andrew, who's next to Peru, on the far left, and then it's very exciting to have Gauda Bagat with us, who's a professor at the National Security Affairs at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. He's originally from Egypt, he specializes in Middle Eastern policy on issues quite regular issues, counter terrorism, Arab Israeli conflict, energy security, as well as American foreign policy in the Middle East. And to his right, to Gaudat's right, is Malan Ritfeld, who is in fact here at the VCC, <coughs> an economics and policy researcher, um, was, a for, was an analyst and advisor to central banks and sovereign wealth, uh, wealth funds and he's completing his PhD in economics from the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. It's worth noting that Malan was also involved in this project, uh, <coughs> which uh, will come through in his remarks, I'm sure. And last, but certainly not least, is Martin Sandu, to my left uh, here, uh, who is, you know, uh, uh, is a journalist with the Financial Times, which is in London, basically the economics editor, expert on natural resource management and natural resource funds. Um, now this year, he's, he's taking a leave to write a book about the European crisis. Uh, I almost mentioned to Michael before, that I mentioned to, to now, is whether a year is enough to write a book about the crisis in Europe. <laughs> but uh, we will see at the end of the day. <laughs> That's right. That means that are, are important. So without further ado, we're going to get started with the 
with a presentation by Karim and by Andrew. Let me just mention that after the, the presentation, we'll have a very interactive, interactive Q&A with the three panelists, and then we'll open up to, to the floor. Not only we'll open up to the floor, but because it is online, this is being webcast, there may be also questions coming online or through, through Twitter. So I have with me the mini iPad in case that, that happens. So don't be surprised if I read a question that you did not ask, but that's coming from 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 there. Um, so let's let's get going early okay. with your presentation. So my time. Sorry, my time to thank you all for coming and attending the launch of our project. Uh, we will, by this presentation, we will, uh, quickly present the findings. For those that are online, uh, you can't really see the PowerPoint, but this is posted on the VCC uh, website. Just on the page where you uh, registered for the event, you can also find the link uh, to the PowerPoint. So to start with, a little bit of definition uh, on what is a natural resource farm. This is a government-owned entity that serves uh, macroeconomic objectives, such as uh, mitigating the expenditure volatility that is due to the community cycle, just you know, as an example. They uh, serve this macroeconomic objective by investing at least a portion, but not necessarily all, of the natural resource revenues in uh, foreign assets. The source of funding comes from oil, gas, and mining. So, a natural resource fund is an extra budgetary mechanism, but it's only one type. It doesn't encompass all types of extra budgetary mechanisms, such as a development bank, a pension fund. Uh, national oil company, this is um, a very uh, specific entity. <coughs> so, <coughs> looking at governance, which is really the topic of uh, this project, we have basically two types of natural resource funds. Those that have helped um, countries escape the resource scarce by helping mitigate the political and macroeconomic impact of the resource boom. So Chile, Norway, I think you all know the examples. And the other type of natural resource fund is those that have helped further the resource scarce by uh, encouraging mismanagement and nepotism and corruption. And you can uh, find this type of funds throughout uh, the continent, from Central Asia to Africa. So what has made the difference between those two types, really, is the rules, the institution, and to what extent those rules and institutions were based on the on a broad consensus. So this observation has motivated us to explore whether we can come up with a governance blueprint to uh, make those natural resource fund work for citizens and. In order to explore these questions, we identified 44 natural resource funds. As you can see from the charts, their wealth is mostly below $50 billion, and the, the source of financing is mostly from oil and gas. Out of those 54 NRFs, we surveyed in detail 22 NRFs um, in 18 national and sub-national jurisdictions looking in particular at the institutional structure, the investment transparency, accountability, and fiscal rules. We selected those 22 uh, NRFs on um, the basis of whether they were uh, interested in on the radar of policymakers and uh, whether the information and the primary source of information was available. So what are our findings? Each profile includes such a slide that is a good governance rating slide. So each profile has a summary of the findings um, summarized in such a chart. Now, in a cross-cutting way, what can we say about those natural resource funds? They have under management $3.5 trillion in assets. Since the year 2000, there, there has been a massive proliferation of funds for the new producers such as Afghanistan, Israel, Kenya, Lebanon, Liberia, Mozambique, 
Myanmar, Niger, Peru, Uganda, Sierra Leone, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Zambia, and more. Uh, it natural resource funds are have been the hope to mitigate the resource scarce and the Dutch disease. Um, Third planning, uh, those uh, natural resource funds are more and more based on growth, uh, but major problems remain with compliance. Some rules are more common than others. There is more focus on uh, management structure rules than on investment risk limitation, transparency, and oversight. That said, um, funds are becoming more transparent, and the Truman Index, um, that is uh, you know, rating all the natural resource uh, funds um, governance and transparency uh, corroborate these findings, but um, despite this fact, only about half of the funds studied uh, release audit and publish specific investment that are prone to generate risk. Out of these findings, uh, we came up with a six-step process, um, which is this that blueprint that I was talking about at the beginning. Uh, which is supposed to help uh, those natural resource funds um, in terms of making the impact that is demanded by the citizens. No, so without further ado, I'm passing on to Andrew that will detail those uh, six steps. Okay, thank you for having um, So let, let me take off where Pavin uh, left it, which is almost a blueprint. So, um, basically, you know, Perrin mentioned all these funds that are not working very well. There's some funds that are working well. So, what are the lessons that we can draw from funds that work well versus funds that don't? Well, what we tried to lay out here is a six-step process that, if a government wants to create a fund, that it ought to follow uh, if it wants the fund to work well. The first one seems pretty obvious. Uh, but it's amazing how many funds don't have don't have this. It's set a clear fund objective. Why are you creating the fund? Uh, just recently in, in the Northwest Territories in Canada, um, they created a, a new sovereign law fund, a heritage fund. Not a single press release, not a single speech mentioned why. They have minerals, so they created the fund. So what, what are the different options that countries have at their disposal? Number one, they can have a fund that saves future generations, uh, a fund that stabilizes the budget, so reduces what we call pro-cyclical fiscal policy to improve the quality of public investments, um, a fund that sterilizes capital inflows, essentially take money out of the economy uh, in order to reduce real exchange rate appreciation and uh, help prevent the Dutch disease. Um, a fund can uh, earmark resource revenues for specific development expenditures, uh, and it can also be a, a, a ring fencing fund. It can protect, if, if it has enough transparency and oversight, it can protect oil, gas, and mineral revenues uh, from corruption, patronage, and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. The most important thing, though, is that the objective be clear, it's be, that the operational rules for the fund be consistent with the objective, uh, and that it be uh, adapted to the needs of the economy. Step number two is establish fiscal rules. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, um, a lot of academic papers, a lot of uh, guidance from, say, the IMF, uh, from academics like, uh, like Paul Collier, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, um, Tony Venables, many others who um, talk a lot about, you know, should countries save more or spend all their um, all their resource revenues, and, and what should be the ratio between savings and spending of oil, gas, and mineral revenues. Um, no matter what <coughs> fiscal rule is chosen, though, that rule has to be operationalized in a law. Uh, actually, it doesn't have to be, because Norway hasn't. Uh, Norway just has a political consensus, but the vast majority of countries do operationalize their rules. Um, and whether you have those rules or don't have those rules, or whether they're clear or not clear, can make a difference between the fund working or not. So just to give three examples, Azerbaijan doesn't have a withdrawal rule, meaning money comes into the fund, but there's no rule for how much is supposed to come out, or when it's supposed to come out, under what conditions it's supposed to come out. 
So you end up with a lot of discretionary withdrawals. Uh, Alberta, in Canada, on the other hand, doesn't have any deposit rules, or didn't. They just changed their, their law. Um, meaning there was no rule on how much money should go into the fund when and how. Um, and so what ended up happening is they had something called a uh, heritage trust fund, which is a bit redundant. Um, and uh, you know they only made two deposits between 1987 and 2013. Um, but then even if you do have these rules, they can be manipulated, as we've seen in a few countries, and we can maybe talk about that later. Um, yeah, we'll talk about Chile perhaps after. Um, step three is establish investment rules. Again, another way that these funds can be mismanaged is if uh, there's too much risk taking, that these investment, that the, the money that goes in is invested poorly uh, or is uh, handed to friends of the regime. Uh, so there are rules that you can put in place to, to limit risk. Um, you can designate the allocation between cash fixed income investments, equities, and alternative assets. Uh, you can prohibit certain high-risk financial instruments or volatile currencies. Um, you can also limit the use of resource revenues as collateral. Again, that's maybe something that'll come up later. Um, one of the more controversial <coughs> recommendations that we're making um, in this report is that funds should not invest directly in the domestic economy. So we all know that resource revenues, I mean, the main purpose of taking assets, you know, mineral or oil assets out of the ground is to invest them in schools and hospitals and roads. But the question is, should natural resource funds or sovereign wealth funds be that vehicle? Or are they a way of bypassing the budget process, bypassing public financial management systems, um, and essentially becoming, do they end up becoming slush funds if they're allowed to invest in the domestic economy. So keeping um, that problem in mind, uh, there's certain uh, certain funds out there. Um, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority puts the Botswana funds, Chilean funds, Kazakhstan, Norway, who have prohibited domestic investment. Um, other countries like Angola, Azerbaijan, Iran, and Russia allow it, sometimes with really, uh, really drastic consequences. Step four. I'll take another two minutes here, is, uh, is to clarify a good institutional structure, essentially make sure that the rules are, are complied with within the system. Norway is a great example of that, uh, where there is uh, oversight at every level of the hierarchy, where the um, parliament oversees the minister of finance, the minister of finance oversees the central bank, um, executive board, the executive board oversees the uh, Norges Bank Investment Management Company, which oversees the fund investments, they oversee the leader group. I mean, there's just oversight at every step. Step five, require extensive disclosures and audit. Um, oversight bodies, parliaments, uh, supervisory councils can't do their job unless they have um, enough information. And so the report outlines all the information that's required in order for these uh, bodies to do their jobs properly, including publication of internal and external audits, which is done very rarely. <laughs> and finally, step six is establish strong independent oversight. There are many different types of oversight. There's legislative oversight, judicial, judicial oversight, civil society, auditor general's offices, even international oversight, Article 4 from the IMF, for example. Um, but you know, the, the work has to be done. And there has to be a critical mass of, of groups and, and individuals looking at whether countries are following their own rules. And, uh, and whether these rules are actually serving the public interest. So all this information is available online. Um, well, the, the website is there, but it's also the, on the last slide. So we encourage you to take a look at the results for yourself. The full report is there. There are 18 fund profiles, like Vivian was mentioning, um, <clears throat> and an interactive map that you, um, that you can click on and do stuff with. Um, what we hope to do, I mean, as, uh, as Lisa was mentioning, this is just the, you know, a first step in this project. In this project. Um, you know, we'll be meeting with others, uh, speaking to, to governments and uh, media and civil society and parliamentarians about these issues uh, going forward. And to the international community, uh, Kevin and I were heading down to DC tomorrow. 
um, where hopefully we'll, we'll have a nice discussion on, um, on sort of building an international consensus uh, on, uh, on good government standards for funds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. It's Karen and Andrew. And you can very, very wise and present. So obviously one cannot judge it with the economy of the research that has gone into this for, for a very long time and that was very important to, to also complement it with what available additional materials from the web and so on. And you spent very quickly some time with very good uh, slides. Um, on the main recommendations that come out from the report, the so-called six steps, setting up the clear fund objectives, establishing the fiscal rules, the investment rules, the institutional structure, the vision of responsibility, the within the institutional structure, as well as extensive disclosure and audit, and last but not least, strongly dependent on the site body, which is one of the recommendations. So those, that's very clear to your rules. Now, very quickly, probably in the earlier part, you went through the results of the uh, in-depth analysis of this fund. And, uh, and maybe you went in a bit political correct, but <coughs> what emerges from that analysis is that there are few that are operating okay. And I must say, for focus probably not very proud to see Chile the government. <laughs> so yes, it can be done, but it may be exception that proves the rule. And they, they are serious challenges with the majority of, the, of them. Which then raises the first question with which I will go to Gaga. Perhaps as a bit of strong man provoking a discussion, why bother? Why bother? There, is there so many like uh, natural resource funds that have been misused? In fact, in some cases a slash fund channel for nepotism, but seem to just not fulfill their objectives. Shouldn't resource rich countries first think very carefully about setting it up as a priority? And in some cases it may be better to avoid setting it up. So I mean can you make the case why why bother? Why should they be set up if the results are so good? good morning and I'm very glad to be here. And uh, probably I would disagree with you they are doing well. Probably uh, once uh, there's uh, the reason for some of the funds because there's too much money and very small market. Uh, all, all my work is on the Gulf of States, Russian Gulf of States, and they have very small education, small market, and they have a lot of money. So uh, they can invest all this money domestically. They have to uh, invest it overseas. And the other option is not to produce oil and gas, keep it underground. And this would be bad for us in the Western United States and Europe because the more they produce, the more the price. So, so far they made the calculation that it is in the best interest to produce more, to take more money, and uh, history proves that they are doing well. The oldest fund is the Kuwait Investment Authority, who was created in 1953, even before the country was born. And during the uh, Iraq occupation of Kuwait, uh, the only world expenses were covered from the Kuwait Investment Fund. The history <coughs> of the population, the war, everything. So, very good investment. Uh, another example during the global financial crisis in the late 2000s, uh, to a great extent, the Gulf states avoided the crisis. Avoided the crisis because of the uh, southern wealth funds. So uh, they are doing good for their countries, for the West. In the United States, here we say money talks. They have money, and uh, without their investment, who would have cared about Qatar? Who would have cared about Abu Dhabi, Dubai? Money talks, and this why when the crown <coughs> uh, UAE comes, he meets with the president, 
of the United States money talks. So uh, they need uh, food for themselves and also is good for us for everyone. Thanks the Gaudi for making the case for it. That's appreciated. So let me go down now to Mara and pick up on that and say, okay, so let's be realistic. And we spoke mostly about the God who is in the whole rest of the world. And we can we will come back to the religion and the God what we do with Martin and the things of that. But then it's, it's a whole set of countries which are incredibly challenged in terms of their institution, at what stage they are in development government, corruption, and so on. So for those highly challenged countries, many of which have recently discovered natural resources, some have had it for a long time, and, and in Africa it's quite prevalent, but not just in Africa, in, America, in some other continents too. Uh, what, what to do to ensure then that uh, mismanagement and even pillage vast amount of corruption is avoided. We heard before from the presentation uh, that there are six steps recommended. But those are, those are generally applicable good, and you may have some, something else, or you may want to say that there are two or three things that are absolutely crucial that need to happen for those most challenged settings in development. Yeah, thank you. So <clears throat> I think um, if we talk about real policy against countries in terms of institutional quality, um, you know, I have little hope that the fund will not be created at some point unless there is some sort of political reform, government reform. But for the sort of in between countries, um, and on the other extreme, we'll have um, Chile and Norway. So you can't have a conversation about good governance without talking about Chile and Norway. Um, but sort of in between countries, and there's a lot of good countries falling into this category, I think a, a natural resource fund is actually one of the better things you can do. Um, the governance challenges of putting money away in a financial fund or financial assets. Doing something very basic on the investment side, like passive investing in terms of following a global benchmark, uh, is one of the easier and more sensible things to do from a government perspective than trying to spend this money in the domestic economy um, a lot of doing for suddenly. Um, the governance challenges are sort of a higher order of magnitude than doing something uh, very basic, like saying we're going to take a portion of this money and put it on a portfolio of financial assets, 50% bonds, 50% global equity. We're not going to try and, as they say in the financial sector, shoot the lights out on the investment performance, but we're just going to have this money. And in terms of the village question, you could build in institutional um, requirements, such as that the central bank governor, the minister of finance, the head of the parliament, all need to sort of sign off on the, on the money before it can be withdrawn. Um, I think it's a, it's a better uh, insurance against uh, debt. And should we focus in those type of settings on a particular objective, whether it be more micro management or activity, stabilization fund for development, or set up different types of funds for start pricing to the objective? I think um, the institution in the government challenge can be a simple objective as it is. What we see in most cases is that we have a stabilization fund and a savings fund. So some of the money will be in highly liquid assets, uh, bonds and money market instruments, so that if they have an unexpected view from oil revenues, um, they can liquidate some of that fund and plug the gap. And some will be in a savings fund with a more long-term investment objective with the idea of saving money for the future and generating investment income in the meanwhile. But uh, in practice, most countries are doing a bit of both in terms of savings funds and stabilization funds. Good. So let's go now to Mark.
think of what I would recommend if you look at my own. Um, even if you succeed, you will do that at the cost of setting up a dual administration that will cause you problems in the long run. But it could be, it just could be the lesser evil at the very, very end. Um, but what I would say, what I would recommend is that generally, don't do it. If you do, it will always be defended and advocated with a very plausible political argument that the force will need to be against other people. It's a strong political argument, as well as happening on the truth. But whenever you hear that you want to ask once, twice, three times the old question of who you vote out, who is really going to benefit from this, who is advocating it and for what reason. Great. And uh, we're being told that for technical reasons, we need to speak up so that all the, the, the online audience <coughs> can, can hear and, and, and join us. Um, this debate actually is a bit reminiscent of something I, I, I've been working on in earlier stages. And this is whether and when it makes sense to set up anti-corruption commissions to fight corruption. So, it, it, it's part and parcel of a broader discussion about institutions of, of restraint against abuse, against executive abuse and other forms of, of misgovernance and when and how it, it does make sense. So there, uh, the, the issue arises that in fact the, these type of organizations and institutions may end up working quite well in countries that don't desperately need it. And while in countries that very, very much need it, and you are giving also those exceptions from investment rules, uh, that they could have investment in countries where there was the public sector, so they function. And then the question I was, which you alluded to, of political economy is what is the chance that they will succeed and they will not be subject to the same capture? the same village and the same political economy forces than the, than the other. So we can go through all these technical and technocratic measures that need to be taken and steps. These are really, really important. But are they likely to succeed in a setup where the politics, where the political economy and the governments much more broadly in the country is not there? So maybe they have If I may, I want to inject one point here. Culture, because to a great extent from our discussion here, I see you are very much uh, believe in our model, our system, and assume that it can be applied in every case. Uh, again, all my work is on the Middle East, and with the exception of Iran, all Southern works funds in the Middle East are pretty much family business. In these six rules, they are very good rules, but they apply here in the US, in Europe, in the Middle East, especially in the Gulf, in Libya, it is family business. Uh, no, what, no parents come to the children and it's decide our objective. It, it does not work <laughs> like this in family. And, uh, and this is why uh, I, I believe, even transparency, uh, people there are more or less happy with the way it is working. In the great extent, country like Qatar <coughs> is buying London, and uh, it is it is family business. The whole country is less than quarter million. So uh, everybody is happy. It is uh, the wealthiest country in the world per capita. And uh, again, probably my point here: we should not assume what works here will work in the case. Cultural sensitivity. Let's go to Martin time. Yeah, follow up. Yeah. I agree completely with the fact that countries are different in very significant <coughs> ways. Now, what is culture? I mean, I like to think of it in terms of political and economy incentives, which, which may in the end look like or be what culture is or the relevant aspects of culture as you make a decision as a government leader or a bureaucrat, what are the incentives you face in terms of making your, your decision. And I just wanted to share one point that's been a theme in the research that I've done on this, uh, together with the current countries and the political science department here. Um, it matters a lot whether there's political competition 
That doesn't have to be democracy, it can be, be plans or even within families, although probably it's not just the funds, it's the countries that have family There isn't much political competition. But one, if there is competition for political power, you can see how there's an incentive for you being in power at the moment, a big windfall comes in. You're trying to find a mechanism by which your opponent, if they win the political context next time around, can't spend all that windfall on their own interests. And you can do that in two ways, either by spending everything today so there's nothing left for them, but that might be hard if there's a lot of it. Or try to compromise, binding yourself in a way that will also bind them, so that in round three, when you get back into power, there will be something left for you. <coughs> That's sort of a stylized political economy model, if you like. But the point is, some of these things might be both more realistic in terms of how they were set up, and more promising in terms of will they work if you have some form of political competition going on in the country in question. Yeah, um, let, me, let me add to this that um, I, I agree that the Middle East that has its own sort of internal political uh, equilibrium and it has its way of doing things. And, and in fact, the Middle East in times are among the oldest and most established and certainly the largest um, weight. Uh, with all the investment authority. So, so I don't think um, we, we, we should expect a rapid transition to, to success in these countries. But again, there is a, on the other side, you have uh, your Chile's and your Norway's that are, uh, um, that are, that are very strong uh, democracies and have strong oversight in the political culture. I think the project speaks to that. But most importantly, the project speaks to a large number of countries somewhere in between. Um, Nigeria, Ghana, Venezuela, um, Timor Leste, and the list goes on and on. Where um, you know, if we say people are happy with the way things are being run in the Middle East with the management of oil revenues, we certainly can't say that for many of the countries I've just mentioned. So, so for these countries, I think um, the six-step process and elements of it um, are very important, and and could go some way towards uh, resolving some of the civil conflicts, some of the um, economic mismanagement that is accompany uh, their resource wealth. So, so there's a sort of very large sample of, of countries somewhere in between the two extremes. You you keep getting brownie points with me by lumping together Norway and Chile. <laughs> <laughs> we we are not there yet. Uh, uh, we aspire someday. So Andrew, uh, yeah. um, no, I mean in some sense. These small countries that, that um, Dr. Baga was speaking to refer to, I mean, they are outliers. Very, very small populations, absolutely massive oil wealth. Um, it would be amazing if people were dissatisfied in that sort of environment, because they just have so much money. Um, but I think this, this draws on the people that made earlier, where I went on in Martin. Um, most countries are not in that situation. I think the question that we're asking is, well, putting aside the question of whether um, these funds should be funded by the businesses. Um, like no, I was saying, there are a lot of countries that, where it's just not. And, and Libya is, is an example of where the fund has gone from being a family business to being no longer a family business. And now <coughs> these assets belong to the citizens of Libya. So the question is in those sorts of uh, circumstances, what kind of rules are put in place? And, um, and, and, and this is a bit philosophical and it's a bit you know, it's very political is um, finding the right balance between discretion and, and rules. And, um, and Libya right now is going through that process, and, and you know, we've seen uh, some involved um, <coughs> in that country. Um, and what we're suggesting here is, is that there are certain areas where rules are useful. And they're useful for two reasons. First, because uh, they do constrain, but also they help build consensus society as to how these resources should be managed. And, um, and I don't think that that is cultural. I think that's something that, that's true. You know. I wanted to uh, go back to this question of uh, interesting and also for me to the domestic So, just to clarify, <laughs> Uh, based on uh, Martin's remarks, is that we are not 
But by saying that the social media should be safe or should have stabilized the budget only, uh, it's clear that for the best use of uh, digital social media is to build uh, long term assets in the domestic economy, such as uh, good uh, human resources and uh, good infrastructure. But we are only saying that uh, the money should not be invested directly, which is this term makes all the difference by the fund. But through the budget, so the fund could earn money for development, but then it should go back to the budget because the budget has the right processes, such as um, you know procurement bidding uh, to invest the economy, and they need to invest the money into the economy. That's a very important point. The engagement, the engagement is the uh, the risk of organizing and policy. I mean, with these, I think it's great time to open this up a bit of introduction. And so we'll open it to, 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 to the floor. And everybody who will speak, please introduce yourself. For technical reasons, you, you, there's no open microphone. So either you accept to come up here and speak from the microphone, or then I will summarize. Please be, be brief. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kelly and I work at the Revenue Watch Institute. Um, I have a question to the panel and to the researchers about whether Chile and Norway are indeed the models that we should be discussing in that, I mean, obviously, they're not um, in setting up their institutional framework for these instruments. They didn't have this sort of pressing development financing gap, as we see in these other countries that are um, developing uh, funds today. Could you or um, anybody respond to that? Anybody who has a related question, please. Otherwise, I go back, I go back to, the, to, the, to the panel. Okay, who wants to take it along with us? I'm not sure. Is the Arnold actually the model? No, they are not the model. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, the lessons we can draw from the Norway and Chile are the ones that Vivian mentioned in her presentation. <coughs> Rules are important, oversight is important, transparency is important, and building a broad consensus around, around those rules. Um, what the rules are, what kind of oversight, I mean, the transparency stuff is pretty, pretty basic, so I think maybe that's, uh, that is a model that we can, we can draw on. But, you know, whether, for example, uh, the judiciary is the main source of oversight versus a supervisory council that they have in Norway, um, that's really context specific. In, in Timor, for example, they do have uh, this sort of consultative council. Um, it, it does its work, but really the oversight mechanism is the judiciary. The parliament went to the uh, to, to the courts and said uh, the government's mismanaging the fund, and the courts found in favor of the parliament. So, so each country is different, um, and and those and you know fiscal rules and all this sort of thing have to be context specific. So we can maybe draw lessons from those cases, but I wouldn't say that they are the model. Um, another project that the So. Timor is they had a fund and is having a fund and that is um, based on the Norwegian model and given how poor Timor is, it was not functioning for Timor is because the money was just saved, um, fully saved in financial assets and never invested in the domestic economy. So we stepped in to change a little bit that and to, uh, under the guidance of uh, Jeffrey Sachs to uh, convince them to, um, to change, to amend a little bit the Norwegian model while keeping the good the good institution and the transparency principles um, being a little bit more flexible in this uh, same world uh, to save uh, the Before turning to the panelists, I will ask both of you, and then in each case, if the panelists want to comment or to a question, but follow up more concretely. Okay, so we need to move beyond just talking about Norway and Chile, because otherwise it will be the exception that proves the rule. Very original first question was really why bother? Uh, so, can you, Karim and, and uh, Andrew, 
from all the research and looking at all those times, mention three or four other countries, not, a, not as a perfect setup, but where there are enough positive developments, lessons, good rules and institutions that everybody should be looking at the report, and that's where uh, for those lessons, even if it's far from perfect. Which one? <laughs> Which one? Okay. Uh, so, so in, in Perrin's uh, presentation, she really laid out the two extremes. The ones where we're pretty sure things are, are working and uh, these funds are helping with managing the macroeconomy, and examples like Brunei, where if you go on their website, all they have is the, the hours that they're open, and I think they're open at 2 a.m. <laughs> um, the in between are the ones that are relatively successful, but maybe don't have the uh, track record yet to know whether they're going to be successful in the long run. Countries like Canada. Canada has a really fantastically comprehensive uh, oil revenue management legislation. Um, they have an oversight body called the Public Interest and Accountability Committee, uh, made of 13 different civil society groups. Um, they've got uh, investment rules, they've got the, and they've got, they've got it all. The framework's in place. Are there challenges in Canada? There are. Um, the finance ministry has filled with some of the uh, oil projections, that, but but it's uh, it, you know everything is in place. Other places, um, I think you mentioned Timor Leste, which again uh, has all these sort of mechanisms in place. A lot of U.S. states, so these are not just national funds; they're also some national funds. Uh, Wyoming, uh, North Dakota, um, Alaska. Well, Alaska is a special case. But um, all, you know, have these institutions. So there are lots of other places. Uh, and, and most recently, Papua New Guinea and Mongolia uh, either passed or are working on passing. <coughs> Any other in Africa? No. And in the US, which state you would not use as an example? Um, <coughs> So, <laughs> no, but this is important because this is not an issue of, of uh, uh, being a rich country as a precondition of being okay. right. And I think this is an important, an important insight. Let's let's go now to uh, to Gauda. And if, from your experience, in addition to the comment you're going to make, if you can mention uh, a case where you've been working on it, where it's well where it's well done. Yeah. First about uh, Norway, Pirini uh, and Andrew talked about the foreign works and uh, I, I believe it is important to put it in historical context. Norway became a foreign exporting country after it, it was well established democracy and this why this foreign tax is more in the Middle East and not in Norway. And this is why also Israel is trying to learn lessons. Israel with uh, the recent natural gas discoveries in its Mediterranean is considering creating some of the fund and Israel <coughs> will much like in a way will establish democracy. So most likely Israel will avoid the oil tax. For uh, for will for successful fund. Uh, I believe Qatar is doing great by buying the whole world in London. They turn their attention to DC now. They are buying neighborhoods in Washington, DC. And uh, the, whole, the, the main goal of the Royal Family in Qatar is to put the country on the map. And they succeeded. Uh, when, when I was teaching uh, in Pennsylvania before I went to DC, uh, many of my students knew about Al Jazeera, then Qatar. They know about the TV station more than the country itself. So uh, Qatar put itself on the map. They have very aggressive investment policy. They are making good money. Again, what is going to ask for being the richest country in the world per capita? Uh, for also 
this family business in the month of the Emirates, the way they create some of what's on the royal family large. So every time one prince wants something, he or she creates some of what's on it. So it is again family business. Interesting in that you were not explicit about an investment in food. Which, which will be the topic for a completely different full session. <laughs> so I'm going to with that, we'll go to that after. So um, just on this question of, uh, of, of the applicability of, of the genetic in way. So yeah, I, I think we need to get away a little bit from this issue of spending versus savings. Um, some funds do a number of other things to stabilize revenue, transform the government's revenue base um, from being perhaps exclusively depending on oil, Nigeria, 90% plus of fiscal revenues come from oil, into something else. Um, and if you thought the financial markets were volatile, have a look at the oil prices, statistically a random book, which means you can't predict it at all. Um, so, so it's sometimes it's a world to just have a supplementary source of income um, that's a little bit uncorrelated with, with, the, with the resource revenue. And, and you can, as, as Martin said, you can spend some of that money. Um, you can spend the real return that you generate on the fund to sustain recurrent expenditures on the infrastructure that you build. So, so just two more points. First of all, you can. The idea is not always to save all the revenues. You can have a trigger price of if oil goes above ninety dollars a barrel. This is what we think we can sensibly spend within a year, which can actually be quite a lot of money. If it goes above that, you're going to save. That surplus um, because we, we think oil prices will come back down to its normal level, so we're just saving the, the unanticipated windfall. So that's the one idea, and then, then very specifically on a, on a country, um, and it's a it's a fund that doesn't do particularly well actually in our in our profiles, but what's one? So they have a couple of of, of other sides though in terms of transparency and in terms of disclosure, but on the concept of having this fund, this is a country that had absolutely enormous development. I mean, there's a paper by, by, um, by um, Asimov and Robinson, they document the whole story. They had 18 kilometers of square, uh, 18 kilometers of roads. They had 25 university graduates and independents, etc. It's, it's the most advanced developed country in Africa, and they've had a sovereign wealth fund. And the, the investment income from the Pula Fund is the second biggest source of fiscal revenue for government every year. So they are spending quite a bit of financial income. Very good. You mentioned this one. Uh, Mark, I'm not sure of good things. I can sense I've said a few things, but to your question first, for the audience question, another example. I quite like the Alaska Fund. I noticed that the researchers didn't want to, didn't mention it either positively or negatively. I don't know why. Of course, it's special because it distributes cash directly to the population. Uh, I actually think that's a model a lot of poor countries with weak public administrations should be considered very, very seriously. I just wrote a proposal that countries should set up what I call national, natural wealth accounts. I think there's important political economy advantage of involving citizens directly uh, in some of this money stream. That can then be taxed by the government and then you automatically get it through the budget. Anyway, that's, that's a bit of an eccentric view. Not many people agree with me, but I think at least it's worth Keeping an eye on that, on that model. What they certainly, what they certainly have achieved is to save, as opposed to use up all the money. <clears throat> um, Norway and Chile. As a Norwegian whose wife is Chilean, you kind of expect me to to say that they certainly are models. <laughs> um, I, I think actually I'll be a little bit contrarian here. I think there's a lot to learn from those funds. Um, yes, of course, especially Norway doesn't have the development needs of most natural resources. Chile does a bit more, and we should note that relative to Norway, the Chilean fund rules actually spend a lot more or save a lot less of the income than Norway does. Norway saves everything. The Chilean fund does more stabilization than saving comparatively. And that's right. I mean, Chile is a poorer country. Uh, I think it would probably have benefited Chile to put in place those sorts of rules much earlier on. Uh, they only started about 10 years ago. Um, but what is common for all natural resource rich countries is that the oil and gas and minerals you take out of the ground, you're not going to use them domestically. The only thing you can do with them is to sell them to the world and then use the money somehow. 
So it's always going to be used to finance car account deficits. And then depending on the country, there's a different optimal size of that car account deficit, and there's a different optimal use of that car account deficit. But so, so they're more similar than, than you might think. You just what you should follow isn't the exact fiscal rule. That would be silly. What you should look at is maybe the micro political economy. Why do they work? And I think they work because they manage to create a sort of equilibrium between different competing political constituencies. Norway is a democracy, Chile is a democracy. They're both competitive policy polities. And I think the reason why they work is because they give pretty much every political actor, at the very least, an assurance that everyone is going to play by the rules so far as it comes to spending this money. And that's tremendously important. That requires some trust. But one thing a natural resource fund can do, because it can add extra transparency, is to gradually build up trust when, when it exists. If everyone can see what you take out, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit harder to cheat. Let me push you a bit there. But first, I, I like very much how this conversation is going because maybe uh, they might not, not mechanistically think about Norway and Chile as, as quote unquote the models. <clears throat> but increasingly, you are saying, let's look at Chile very carefully in terms of our investments for other emerging economies and developing countries because it may be more relevant. Uh, than the case of Norway. And we'll go back to the but just on one question. This competitive quality is a really important notion. And you seem there a little to distinguish between that and the fuller fledged democracy having full transparency, voice, and democratic accountability, which the Norways and the Chiles do have. You have in mind the country, or a few countries were not there yet in terms of democracy and this, this more open structure, but there is sufficient competitive quality from your research that you're doing with, with Colombia, where this can it can work because it meets at least the minimum requirement that sets which is even was even perhaps more crucial than other uh, I'm I'm not going to give very concrete examples because my research is it's brought to in the present tense, it's getting a bit dated. Um, I just want to make this point then Competition is not, does not require democracy, formal democracy or elections. There are a lot of ways people compete for power um, and they don't have to involve elections. And indeed, as we all know, sometimes elections don't actually involve competition. So it's a different dimension. Um, but in all but the most totalitarian dictatorships, there's always competition for power. And indeed, a dictator may have his power contested more strongly than a democratically elected government. Um, what I want to say is that those are the sorts of features of, call it the political culture, you can use the, the word culture, but those are the, the country-specific characteristics you really want to look at, and you should be more optimistic about what a fund can do in the situation where you can identify different political movements or different political constituencies that are actually in a tension against each other because that tension can be turned into something creative. Great. We go back. <coughs> yeah. We'll take two or three in a, in a row and then we'll go back to the panel. Thank you very much, Ray. I'm very interested. Uh, My name is Ulanga Kampoviak and I'm from Unity. Um, thank you very much, Karim, for clarifying that domestic investment uh, that you're recommending not um, we are recommending stopping domestic investment, not in general, but only from the sovereign wealth funds. Um, I agree um, with the findings of your research in the sense that um, the sovereign wealth funds should be used both for saving and stabilization on one hand and on spending on the other hand. Um, I've been doing some research on Mongolia in the context of broader social investment of mineral wealth and looked a little bit into the um, wealth fund or kind of successions of it which were created and the main reason for the failure of the funds which were in operation until 2012 was that there was no firewall so to speak between the savings and stabilization on one hand and the um, uh, spending on social welfare 
So the, um, but my question is actually to go uh, to domestic investment. Um, so the question on uh, domestic investment. So what I understand from your recommendation is that the sovereign wealth funds you are recommending to spend more on investment, while if it is spending, then it should be channeled through the regular budget, right? The domestic investment might have kind of it can go from one um, um, spectrum to another. Kind of it's a broad spectrum. If it's domestic investment to kind of strongly viable domestic enterprises. It, is, it can be seen as a form of investment, whereas on the other side of the spectrum, if it is, um, let's say, general support to SMEs, let's say non-mining or non-oil SMEs, then it can be seen as more spending. Um, so in, in that case, um, would there be a role for using certain wealth funds for domestic investment in strongly viable enterprises? Thanks. Hi, my name is Peter Burgess. Um, I did engineering at Cambridge about 50 years ago. And I did some economics, and then I went to even further down the, the slippery slide and became an accountant. And then I came to Canada and America and uh, had a corporate career. Um, then I did work with the UN and the World Bank uh, around the world. And, you know, I'm at the point in my life where I'm really pissed off. <laughs> um, the, the word that I would have liked to have heard somewhere today was accounting and accountability. Um, I've been around the world and I've found junior accountants who've been extremely good. It doesn't matter whether it was in Kazakhstan or Nigeria or, you know, the junior accountants who do excellent work. Their supervisors can't. And the further up the pyramid you go, the more money is sloshing around unaccounted for. The scale of corruption on our planet, and I'm talking about, I've been looking at this stuff for 30 odd years, and I just said, I'm mad as hell. Because we do you know, very superficial stuff. Uh, I like Ghana. Ghana's got very good accountants. I started to nosy around a bit with gold in Ghana, which was predate, you know, as a resource, predate. Yeah, well, my question is, you know, what is going to change something so that we really have the money being used for something that's worth a damn and not just making leaders richer and richer and richer? That's clear. <laughs> if I can ask everybody to go quick to the question, so to give the chance for the point. So what is the question? Uh, let's say uh, we have a company with our financial gas, <coughs> and <coughs> with their uh, price mechanisms so haven't been uh, fully marketized, and so on and so forth. Uh, so how would the natural funds, natural resource funds, and the master choose these funds? And how the, uh, the farms and governments works, uh, if possible, can use an example of uh, the United States and any points in history. And the country. Uh, <coughs> from China. I'm uh, sure. Okay. Hi, I'm Jody Liz. I just finished the project for the World Bank of the United Nations on value chain. Inspector resources. Um, there are two things that I'm wondering that I don't see in this report that I think are critical to a successful implementation of what's in there. One is the lack of capacity. And I don't see anyone to address that. You can have, and I can tell you this from somebody who's worked in the world, that you can have the greatest ideas and the greatest ways of managing things, but you don't have capacity on the ground and the will to make the capacity is very big trouble. Is this going to be something that you're addressing as you? Or further on this project. The second thing is that I kind of, I mean, I haven't read the report on this. So I'm wondering about the relationship with the general public. Um, natural resource funds are wonderful if you have money or a very, very small population. So the question is what is the relationship going to be support for the public or return for the public? Because whether or not you have a 
natural resource money, people want to see something back. The project we did, we could have wonderful macroeconomic policies, we them, have hundreds of conflicts on the ground. You see Chile, you see other countries, Norway, you see something coming back to the people. And I want to know if somebody can hear can address whether or not I how you can make a greater return for the public when they see and feel the virtue of these funds. Good morning, my name is Kamaji Nahara. I'm the Chief Scientist in Climate Change and Science. So I don't have experience in natural resource funds, but I do have some experience in climate finance in Southern Africa. And the reason I came along today is because on a much smaller scale, the moments I think significant in this. Uh, we're seeing some similar issues coming up in Southern Africa and in East Africa around visibility, around um, accountability, and around opaqueness of climate management. And I think that the learning curve is we're, we're, it's much earlier than us. So I'd be interested to know if anyone on the panel has some thoughts around that. Climate financing, it's very early days. Uh, there's a lot of lack of capacity. I wonder if we could learn anything from the discussion around natural resources. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
to whoever controls them by not selling them at market prices. It's not something a resource fund can do much about. You should, of course, set up a fund with rules about how money should go straight from sales into the fund and so on. But I think you basically identified one of the many other problems that we have with natural resource revenues. And one maybe where we can't really hope that we can't hope that NRFs will do will solve every problem. Um, so it's probably it's something that happens earlier in the value chain. It needs to be fixed, many of the same principles apply, but it probably can't be solved through an institutional fix at the resource fund itself. Um, and finally, now let me remember the last question. Yes, it was how do we involve the population? Um, the two ways to think about that. Does the population feel that it gets anything back in terms of better conditions of living? I mean, that's what we all hope for. Um, that's a very big question that I'll, I'll put to one side. The narrower question is, how do you get the population politically involved in feeling that it has a stake? Because the problem in many natural resource-rich countries is that oil and gas and mineral energy allow the state to float off completely separately from the population. Um, now, I've, as I said, I thought that distributing at least some of the money to the population is a way to do that, to reconnect the social contract. But even short of that, just finding ways of letting people know how much money there is and how much is spent would actually, I think, make a big difference. If you, and again, it comes back to transparency, if every citizen, even of a poor country, knew that if the oil price is $100 a barrel, my share of this new fund is $30. You would suddenly find them starting you asking new questions of the government, saying, "Well, how is that thirty or hundred or three hundred spent on money?" <laughs> so I think there are ways. Thank you, Mark. Um, I will um, I will briefly touch on the question on, on the domestic investments um, and also the capacity question, and then finally just some very brief thoughts on, on deforestation and, and the negative externalities of your investment. So. On domestic investments, I, I completely agree that you can make a case for doing all kinds of different domestic investments with different objectives. I think the point of the project is, uh, as a gold standard, we would like to see people being honest and clear about what the objective is. Because we can say there's a higher return on domestic investment um, than on foreign assets, but sometimes uh, people are willing to do pure public investments, not expecting to make a return um, for the sake of industrial development for the sake of diversifying the economy. And as long as I think, uh, we're honest about what the purpose of the domestic investments are, um, we've taken a step forward. Um, on the issue of capacity, I think, and, and, and I'll take this as a very narrow sense of sort of public sector capacity skills in the public sector, you know, this kind of question. I think the lack thereof is an argument in favor of having a natural resource fund. Um, and having a particular kind of natural resource fund that's not trying to be the best global investor. That is Botswana and again our, our favorite country of Chile, they manage they are able to manage billions of dollars in their natural resource funds with sort of ten people and two Bloomberg screens because they're not trying to do anything particularly fancy um, with the investments. They're just passively investing in the global markets. And I think the the capacity you require to do that is much smaller than the capacity of managing a large windfall in the domestic economy, coordinating how you're building bridges, ports, and hospitals, and all the new nurses for the hospitals, and all of these questions. Um, then finally, on Norway, um, if, you know, if they are funding deforestation through their equity and all things, I think they're probably looking at it. Um, it's hard to find an investor in the world um, that is more progressive uh, than the Norwegian sovereign wealth funds in terms of their ethical standards. They do negative screening of tobacco companies, arms companies, they do positive screening of countries that they think uh, of companies and investments that they think are good for the world, like green investments. Um, I'm sure there are still things that slip beneath the radar, but I think they are completely at the bank of, of ethical investments um, and, and good for them for that. Thanks, Mara. Yeah. Well, that. I will address two points about diversity uh, and Public opinion capacity. Most uh, Middle Eastern countries lack uh, the human resources to manage the funds, and they make up for this by hiring the best accountants in the United States and in Europe. 
probably uh, Libya is a good case where they have their own people and most of the patients world. But uh, for country seats, they are hiring the best money can buy. And because of this, to great extent, there is green, green the other way around, from the west to the south. For uh, giving something to the public, making the public satisfied or happy, I will share with you two stories. One in the Latin American rights about a year ago, I was there and talking to two people there. And by asking if you have to unemployment, like in the US, it's about 7%. They looked at me and I saw they did not understand my accent. And they told me anybody who wants to work, he or she can work with the government. The government is there. Uh, in Kuwait, a few months ago, uh, the Kuwaiti Amir decided we have too much money, so he forgave all the debts. Anybody, all the government, anything was forgiven. So the public is happy, and this is why there is no air of spring in both oil countries. Maybe as a friend, it was that yeah, that was. Um, so, uh, I'm going to answer questions one, two, and four, um, but maybe backwards. So, the first, I don't have much to add to what um, Ron and Mark were saying about capacity. Um, of course, it gets quite important, um, but if you have the right rules in place, it becomes less important. So, if you take away the discretion of, uh, similar to what Ron was saying, um, of, of investors or, or investment managers and say you're investing, you know, 80% in fixed income with these sorts of, uh, you know, must be AAA or whatever, whatever it is, then um, you don't need, it, it doesn't need to be rocket science, for example. And managing expense doesn't need to be rocket science. And so the question is, even where we do have these rules, why do we still see this management? Well, maybe it's not a capacity issue. Um, maybe it's on purpose. And, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly what happened in this particular case, but like I said, in Indiana, they keep on um, overestimating uh, oil projections or oil revenue projections. And I spoke to somebody at the World Bank thinking maybe it's a capacity <laughs> issue. And I said, no, 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 we've done 10 trainings on projecting these revenues. But they keep on getting it wrong. So clearly there's something else going on. Um, on the issue of some wealth funds, being investment banks uh, or, or investing in the local economy. Um, again, I, mean, I'll, you know, I don't want to repeat what they said, but what we're recommending is, is not, not investing in the local economy. It's, it's just not using your sovereign wealth fund to invest directly in the local economy. And also being very clear about what the objective of the fund is. If the objective of the fund is stabilization and savings, then maybe it should be used as an investment bank. If it's going to be used as an investment bank, and, you know, provide credit to local businesses then, then, then say so. It's there seems to be and where, where you have this mismatch of objectives versus the way that the fund is behaving, um, then you have you're opening yourself up for to abuse of some kind. And then the last point is on the importance of accountability. Um, if you want you know and, and this point of having the right accountants and, and you know having accountability at the lower levels but not necessarily at the higher levels. Um, I think if you have the right institutional structure in place, then that helps. In other words, if you have accountability at the top, the Minister of Finance is accountable to the Parliament, and uh, you know, the manager, fund managers are accountable to the Minister of Finance, that improves the situation. But really what you need more than anything else is broad-based consensus. And what they did, and, and actually Mark can probably speak about this better than I can, um, in Sao Tome, when they set up their fund, they literally ran around every village and said, we're setting up this fund, how should we manage it? They did it in Indiana, same thing. There were public consultations around the country on should we be setting up this fund, how much should we save, how much should we spend, how should the fund be managed. Um, in the Northwest Territories, they're doing the same thing. When you have this sort of consensus, so then there's these people who are part of these meetings are more likely to uh, oversee or, or at least be interested or monitor fund behavior. And so, you know, I think that's, that's another strategy. It's something that's not happening in other countries like Colombia, where 
you're also saying that the product is like there's no other consensus. Yeah, so, so that's one. Can you be quick? Yeah. Your comment before, one word that was not used at all 
this leadership. And they, they are settings where there is a lot of misgovernance. But a leader can come into chaos and make the case for this type of institution when there is very strong and ethical leadership of this type of thing, of, uh, on, on one type of institution, to an extent, can uh, make things happen and uh, can even have <coughs> an effect on other organizations. There are good examples from central banks and other in the midst of this government and many other organizations. So I like to leave also with the thought, knowing that there are many future leaders here, students <coughs> and others, that the issue of leadership is, is particularly critical. So even if the, the place is, the, the setting is very challenging, People in, in positions of, of leadership can make a, a big difference. Yeah. But <coughs> this basically is trying to encompass a little bit of a very, without doing for just a very rich discussion that happened here. There's much more also in the, <coughs> in the materials which are already in the web. I want to thank enormously all of you for being here and so involved. Those that are online, they're in. <coughs> And Andrew for the great work, the other researchers who have been involved, and particularly panelists, uh, some of which have come from afar for this event and for the great insights. Thank you very much, and a round of applause.